Well, first of all, thank you very much for including our paper in the program. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and as uh, Soriana was saying, uh, I'll be talking about um, sorting uh, default and create default subs today. Um, this is very much a work in progress, so uh, all comments are, are very welcome. Um, as this work with Gray and Bruno, who work at the Richmond Fed, uh, the usual disclaimer supply is only our vision. So let me start by saying that the credit default swaps uh, are widely used uh, to reallocate credit risk uh, across different types of participants in, in uh, sovereign bond markets. Uh, and these uh, contracts involve a seller who provides a, a, a buyer with insurance against a specific uh, default risk. So we are going to be mainly focusing on uh, sovereign CDS, which are CDS associated to a sovereign default episode. Uh, which are uh, very large in volume in spite of being trading over the, the counter markets. Um, however, despite we don't have a lot of sovereign default models uh, in which the credit default swaps are incorporated and taken uh, seriously, uh, policy has regulated the CDS markets, as for example, when the European Union banned naked CDS in 2012. And the question here is uh, why, why are these uh, policies a good idea to, to implement? So the research questions that we are going to be trying to address in this paper are the following. Uh, first, we're going to try to understand how the CES and bonds are used to allocate credit risk across different types uh, of investors. And in particular, we are going to focus on what is, what is the role of trading frictions in over-the-counter markets when this reallocation of credit risk uh, is going on. Um, and then we're going to try to understand uh, implications of having this insurance or this credit default swap market for the sovereign bonds market. We're going to try to see how the bond price responds to the existence of this uh, alternative asset that provides insurance against default risk and what are the implications for sovereign debt management and uh, default uh, risk. And then we will wonder whether we should regulate the CDS or bond markets in some kind of, of way. Uh, so more precisely, what we are going to do uh, in this paper is that we are going to develop a sovereign default model in which we are going to incorporate a CDS market. The sovereign default model is going to be a, a standard sovereign default model as, a, a, as in uh, Eton Gersowitz or, or Arellano, for those that are familiar with those type of models. Uh, and then uh, we are going to incorporate um, the, the, the trading frictions in over-the-counter markets, bo both for bonds and CDS, uh, using uh, search frictions, in particular directed search, um, uh, as in, uh, as, as in, in, in work by Peter Olivier and others. Um, so we are going to um, be, or investors are going to be using bonds and CDS in, in this model to maximize uh, some return risk preferences uh, of uh, two types of, of participants in the market. Ones are going to be large dealers and we also will have some smaller investors where the main difference is between these two types of investors is going to be that they will be facing different trading uh, frictions and they will have different uh, risk tolerance. Um, then we will use this model to do some positive analysis and we'll try to quantify uh, the role of uh, trading frictions in explaining the bond prices. Uh, and then um, we are also going to try to quantify how the sovereign bond prices is affected by introducing an insurance uh, asset as the credit default swap. Um, and then the next thing we will do with the, with the model is try to do some policy analysis and quantify, quantify the effects of some alternative uh, constraint that could be implemented in bonds or CES market. As for example, we could um, ban or restrict, restrict or, or allow for bond short sellings, or we could uh, constrain the allocations that can be uh, occurring in CDS market, for example, banning naked CDS or shutting down the CDS market and explore what are the implications for uh, sovereign bonds markets. Um, here I'm going to preview some preliminary results uh, as these uh, results are evolving as we are incorporating more and more data into this uh, project. But so far with the current calibration of the model, um, we are uh, obtaining the following results. 
Uh, about the role of trading friction in explaining uh, bond prices, we, we find that out of the total uh, sovereign spreads of, uh, this is a particular result for Argentinian government bonds uh, over US bonds, like 27% of, of the spread is due to trading friction on average uh, and not to uh, default risk. Um, and this uh, spread, this illiquidity spread or the cost of trading friction uh, gets worse uh, when uh, we are closer to a debt crisis. Um, about the role of CDS in, in, in the market, we, we, we find ambiguous results. Uh, comparing a, bench, a benchmark model with a CDS market to an alternative model where we don't allow CDS to be traded, um, we will find that in some states of the economy, the, the price of the bond is higher, but in some other states it's lower. And this uh, also depends on, on the parameters that, that we uh, put in the model. Um, and then uh, relative to our benchmark, benchmark calibration uh, with a CDS market and where we don't allow for bond short sales, um, we will consider um, alternative regulations and how the sovereign bonds price respond. And we'll find that uh, allowing for short sales of bonds will actually increase the bond prices. Um, if it will, the uh, buying naked CDS also improves uh, bond prices. Uh, but if we completely shut down the credit default swap market, uh, that will result in uh, lower bond prices. So what I'm going to do in this talk is that I'm first going to show you some data that we are putting together to try to approach this issue. And then uh, I'm going to uh, show you a part of the model uh, that, that I think is the one you will be more interested on and, and, and where I can get more, more feedback here. Um, and, and then with all that together, we, we will see how we are finding uh, these results. So in terms of data, uh, we are using a rich data set uh, where, where we have access to transaction level data on sovereign CDS from the Depository Trust and Clean House Corporation, where we can see all the, all the CDS transactions uh, that are done in which uh, a, a, a financial institution that is regulated by the Federal Reserve is participating. We aggregate those transaction monthly by financial institution. So we can actually compute the position of uh, in, CDS, uh, in CDS contracts of each financial institution regulated by the Federal Reserve. We are putting together that with the bond position. So we, we can have the, the actual exposure to sovereign default risk um, uh, for, for, for several financial institutions. We also have information on bond yields and, and CDS spreads uh, and bonds, uh, um, CDS BDASC spreads as measure of uh, trading frictions in, in, in these over-the-counter markets. And then we are going to divide participants or financial institutions into two categories. Uh, we are going to put together um, the top 10 dealers by volume and we are going to call these in in, in this, this, uh, financial institutions the dealers. And then all the other ones are going to be small investors that we are going to call uh, investors. Um, and from this data, what, what we observe is the following. Uh, we see that in the CDS market, uh, the, the CDS transactions are highly intermediated by these top 10 dealers. Uh, uh, out of all the transactions, 96% 96, 96 of the transactions have at least one of the top 10 dealer participating in, in the transaction. About 44% are transactions uh, inter-dealer and about 52% are a transaction between a top 10 dealer and uh, some more, a smaller investor. We see that the top 10 dealers are uh, on average net sellers of, of CDS. So they are actually providing insurance to all the other investors uh, on average. And uh, what we find interesting is that as um, the yields of, of a sovereign bond increase, um, the dealers provide more insurance, meaning that they, they are selling more, more and more CDS uh, contracts. Um, we also see that the dealers provide more liquidity or ease of transactions as the yields are, are, are increasing. Uh, and both uh, when, when, when the yields are going up or the probability of default is higher, uh, dealers are both buying and selling more CS contracts and, and creating more, more market. 
And finally, uh, from this data, we observe that the VDASC spread usually increase when uh, we are closer to uh, a dead crisis or, or a default episodes and yields are, 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 are higher. Um, so to interpret that, we, we put together a, a sovereign default model where the, there is a government uh, strategically deciding whether to default or not on the outstanding stock of debt to maximize the welfare of a representative household in a country. Um, and that's going to be one part of the model, but the prices of, of the assets are going to be determined uh, in an over-the-counter block of the model. Uh, and this is the part of the model that I'm going to be focusing on. Um, so this over-the-counter block of the model is going to have a two-period structure. So invest, investments are done today and payoffs happen tomorrow. Um, and, and in this block, we are going to take as given government choices, meaning the supply of uh, sovereign bonds and the probability of a default. Then in the full model, that's, those are going to be endogenous choices that the government will have to, to make. Uh, in the model, we'll have uh, three assets. There is going to be a risk-free asset uh, that we're going to call A, and it's uh, imperfectly elastic supply. It's going to be equal, the, the, the price is going to be equal to the discount factor, and it's going to be traded in a perfectly competitive valuation market with no frictions. Um, then we will have sovereign bonds and insurance against default uh, with uh, CDS. Now, there are going to be uh, different market participants with different uh, market access. Uh, we will have uh, the risk averse dealers, which are representing these top 10 dealers in the, in the data. And uh, they are going to be have uh, been access to, to an inter-dealer variation market where all dealers can trade with each other for free in a competitive market. So that's to represent that um, it's easier uh, to, 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 to have inter-dealer trading uh, than uh, transactions between uh, a dealer and, and smaller investors, uh, put in a, in, in a kind of a stark way. Um, but um, dealers can also meet uh, smaller investors in over-the-counter markets where they are uh, trading frictions, in particular search frictions. Um, now, there are going to be also risk-averse investors, and this risk-averse investor can only trade bonds or um, CDS by meeting a dealer in an over-the-counter market. So these uh, investors have to go through a decentralized market to trade. And in particular, the way we are going to be modeling uh, this decentralized market, uh, this over-the-counter market is going to be using uh, directed search. Um, and this, uh, well, specifically what we are doing here is that um, both uh, dealers and investors, when, when they want to trade in the over-the-counter market, they can visit uh, a continuum of some markets that are characterized by an intermediation fee. This is the intermediation fee that uh, the dealer will charge to the, to the investor if there is a transaction or the market. And that is what is going to generate VDAS spreads in the model. Now, endogenously, uh, this uh, difference of markets with different markups or intermediation fees are going to come together with different trading probabilities for the dealers and for the investors. The, the trading probability for the dealer is going to be denoted uh, rho, and the trading probability for investors is going to be called alpha. So um, this is going to be determined endogenously, endogenously and I'm, I'm going to show you in a second how, how it happens. Now, about the dealers, uh, let me show you what they what they are trying to do in these markets. Uh, so active dealers, uh, I'm going to define what active is, um, are choosing their portfolio. They are buying risk-free assets, bonds, and CDS to maximize their risk-adjusted profits or, or utility, which is denoted by pi here. Uh, so remember that these dealers can access a, an inter-dealer market all the time, so where they trade uh, without any frictions, so they can adjust the portfolio immediately whenever they want. Uh, so what they do is that they pay the price of the risk-free bond uh, to, to, to purchase risk-free asset, they pay the price Q of sovereign bonds uh, to acquire sovereign bonds, and then uh, to purchase or sell CDS, they will be uh, paying the price P for, for CDS. And then in the next period, they have a discount rate beta, 
uh, they will get the returns uh, from these assets, but they will have some concavity in the utility from those returns. And that's what is going to gi give us the risk aversion. So uh, if there is no default and, and Delta is equal to zero, they uh, will get the returns from the risk-free asset and the sovereign bond. And if there is a default, they will get the returns from the risk-free asset and the CDS. Uh, there might be some constraints in the allocations uh, that, or the, that they can achieve uh, of bonds, uh, CDS, and uh, well, the risk-free asset is unconstrained. Um, and this is what we're going to be playing with when we uh, study uh, regulations in, in these markets. For example, if we ban uh, short sales uh, in the sovereign bond market, the lower bound uh, of bond holdings is equal to zero. Uh, if we don't allow for naked CDS, then the difference between bond holdings and CDS has to be greater or equal than, than zero. Uh, so yeah, they are, they are trying to maximize their, their profits utility. Um, now to be, to be active and be able to trade, uh, these investors will have to uh, pay some entry costs. They, they can pay the entry cost by either uh, entering the bond market or the CDS market in the OTC market and meet uh, some investor. Uh, so the profits from entering either a bond market or a CDS market are given by this capital pie, which depends on the intermediation fee that they decide to charge or the sub market that they decide to enter. Uh, so by entering, they get access to, to choose their portfolio and get the, the, the utility or expected utility pie over the two periods. They have to pay the entry cost gamma and then they get some expected profit for trading with investors in the over-the-counter markets. Uh, so the expected profits are given by the probability of trading in a given uh, submarket times the intermediation fee that they charge to investors in case that they trade. Uh, there is going to be a free entry of dealers into any of these submarkets. So whenever there is uh, some amount of transactions or some volume of transaction in any submarket, it has to be true that these gains from entering the submarkets have to be equal to zero because of free entry. So in the end, the probability of trading for a given dealer is going to be pinned down by the gains from being active minus the entry cost. Um, and then uh, since uh, this capital pi has to be equal to zero, that will imply that in some markets where they get a higher intermediation fee, in equilibrium, they will be facing a lower probability of getting matched with an investor and trading. Um, so for dealers, higher intermediation fees mean lower probabilities of trading, but the opposite will happen for investors. Since there are more dealers in uh, some market with higher, higher intermediation fees, uh, investors that are willing to pay higher intermediation fees are going to face a higher probability of trading or they will be able to trade faster. Um, the mass of dealers, as I'm saying, is going to be determined endogenously um, and it's going to be denoted by D. And this free entry condition is going to uh, imply that uh, in some markets where the intermediation fees for trading are larger, there are going to be more dealers uh, participating. And more dealers is, uh, or the, the, the mass of dealers that is active in the, in the economy uh, is going to be key to determine the asset prices and, and the risk tolerance of, of the economy as a whole. And this is because uh, dealers have access to the inter-dealer market where they can adjust their portfolio. So the more dealers there are, the more the risk of uh, default can be shared across uh, different, different dealers and the lower is going to be the risk premium in the market. So that will uh, improve the, the price of the bonds in the end or will reduce the cost of insurance. Now, the investors um, are, are going to be only trading in over-the-counter market. Uh, we are going to set up the model uh, sequentially, but this is uh, not key uh, for, for the model actually. Uh, so we are going to start by saying that, that the, the investors first go and try to buy bonds. They pick a, how much intermediation fee or the VDASC spread that, that they are willing to pay uh, in order to purchase some amount of bonds. And then uh, they, they, after that, they can 
attempt to, to, to get match in, in the CDS market, pay some intermediation fee and purchase CDS. And finally, they choose uh, where they want to go to the valuation market and, and how many uh, assets, uh, they, the risk-free assets they want to get. Uh, the, the payoff of the, of the dealer after all the transaction happen, of the investor after all the transaction happen, is going to be almost the same as for dealers with a few differences. Uh, investors are going to be paying intermediation fees, uh, so that, that's an extra payment that they have to make in the, in the first period. And then in the second period, they are going to have a different utility function. Uh, this is to allow for difference, differences in, in risk uh, aversion. And then uh, we are going to add this omega in the payoff in the case that there is uh, no default. Uh, just to tweak the portfolio uh, and say that the, 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 the portfolio of investors might be different to that of dealers and, and they might be uh, wanting to have a different, a, a different composition between bonds and, and CDS and risk-free assets. Uh, this, expo this exposure is going to be in the exogenous. Um, it's going to be, we're going to play with this. Uh, I don't have uh, time today to, 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 to tell you all, all, all the things we do with that. Um, all right, that, so that's more or less the setup. Uh, to find the prices of bonds and CDS, we have to clear the market. So the demand for bonds will, from both dealers and investors has to equal the supply from the government and the CDS have to be in total uh, equal to zero, uh, the amount of CDS contracts. From this uh, small model, we are going to be able to find some uh, kind of key results um, that, that I'm going to summarize here. And then I'm going to move to, to the quantitative model. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the interdealer market, since there are no frictions, the CES bond base is hold, meaning that if you trade a, a bond and, and a CES, it's the same as uh, paying for a risk free asset. Uh, but um, notice that since there are trading costs for dealers, uh, not, the, not the price of the bond, neither the, the price of the CDS are going to be purely reflecting the probability of a default. So if you want to measure the probability of a default by looking at bond prices or CDS prices, in the two cases, you're going to be uh, mismeasuring the probability of a default. Uh, and this is because there have to be, uh, the, 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 these transactions are costly and dealers have to pay entry costs. Um, it also can be uh, because of um, risk aversion and risk premium, but as this uh, transaction cost vanish and the entry costs go to zero, then the price of the bond and the price of the CS actually reflect the exact probability of uh, a default. Now, um, in the over-the-counter markets uh, where dealers and investors are trading, of course, the CS bond basis is not going to uh, hold because there are going to be uh, intermediation fees uh, being paid. Now, um, when we have a, a, a deterministic omega, I didn't explain that, but uh, we will see that investors will like to specialize either in bonds or, or CDS. They want some net exposure to uh, default risk. And if they can achieve it with bonds or CDS, they, they don't mind. So by being able to, to achieve this uh, exposure in either of the markets, they are going to be uh, ha happy. Um, and, and the last thing that I want to mention is that uh, how much they are going to be willing to pay uh, in, for buying bonds uh, in intermediation fee or CDS is going to be um, proportional to the elasticity of the matching function uh, and the gains from trade. So the larger the, the gains from trade for, for for an investor for trading bonds or CDS, the more willing the investor is going to be to pay intermediation fees or a larger, a larger market. Uh, and that's going to have implications for dealer entries. So the, the larger are the gains from trade, uh, the higher the fees that investors are going to be willing to pay and the more the dealers are going to enter. So when there are more dealers in the economy, as I said before, uh, the risk can be shared uh, uh, across uh, more um, more dealers, uh, and and that will result in a lower uh, risk premium and and, and a lower uh, bond price and a higher bond price. Sorry. Now we are going to put all this 
over-the-counter market structure into a sovereign default model, and we are going to quantify it uh, for Argentina. Um, how many minutes do I have left? Only a couple, right? Well, you know, you have a few minutes, but don't worry. We okay. can use a little bit more later on. So present right. your result. Okay, so uh, we are going to, to calibrate the model for Argentina. All the facts that I showed you before are uh, results for 49 countries that we have in our data set, but we are going to focus on Argentina because it's the, the country that is widely used in the sovereign default literature. Uh, so to map it, our measures of VDASC spread in the data, we are going to be using this uh, entry cost in the bond and CS market that dealers have to pay uh, in order to, to target the observed VDASC spreads in our data set. Uh, now, we will have to normalize one of the risk aversion parameters, and we are going to say uh, that the investor risk aversion is going to be uh, equal to two, which is a standard uh, risk aversion value uh, in CRRA utility functions in macro. And, and we are going to be um, using uh, the, the risk aversion uh, for dealers, the investor exposure, and the elasticity of the matching technology to capture some features of uh, the data. So uh, one of the features in the data that, that we want to uh, replicate with the model is this observation that um, the net position of dealers is on average uh, negative. So dealers provide insurance, and also they provide more insurance as the yields increase. So the, the, the position gets more, more negative. Uh, so two parameters are going to be key to generating that. Uh, first is this uh, exogenous ex exposures of investor uh, is going to determine how much of the bonds uh, this uh, and the CDS these investors want to have in the portfolio, and on average, how much of the bonds are going or CDS have going to be held by uh, the the dealers. Uh, but more importantly, or more interestingly, I think is uh, the slope of, of uh, this relationship between yields and dealers' position that is going to be uh, replicated by changing or by parameterizing the risk aversion of dealers. So what is going on here is that dealers, is, dealers are going to be uh, less risk averse uh, than investors uh, in this model. And as the probability of a default is going up, uh, since dealers are risk averse, it's going to be more efficient for uh, dealers to absorb the, the credit risk. So as the, as the yields are going up because of an increase in the probability of a default, the uh, dealers are going to be absorbing more and more of, uh, the, of the default risk, and they are going to be offering more insurance. Uh, so we are going to replicate that with the model using those parameters. And the other fact that we'll replicate uh, is that the VDASC spreads of bonds uh, are increasing in uh, the probability of a default or with the yields. Uh, so to do that, uh, what is key to, to replicate the slope is, is the elasticity of uh, the matching technology in the over-the-counter markets. Um, so we are going to be pinning down the elast elasticity of the matching function to try to replicate this positive relationship between uh, yields and the VDASC spread in, in the bond market. Um, so we first uh, tried to tackle the, the question of how much of the spreads uh, observed in the sovereign bond market are coming because of probability of default and how much is uh, by, because they have to face these trading frictions in the over-the-counter markets. Uh, so comparing the benchmark model to a model where the markets for bonds are perfectly liquid, uh, we observe that the price of uh, that the spreads for sovereign bonds are 27% larger in the in the benchmark model, and we conclude that uh, out of total credit spread, 27% uh, is uh, due to the existence of these trading frictions in over-the-counter market. Uh, now, um, let me show you what happens in this model as the economy is getting into a recession and the probability of a default is uh, increasing. So. Uh, we have here the GDP in the model, in, in the full model that, that I didn't present in detail, uh, but the economy is going into a recession and it's more tempting for the government to default and that's why the sovereign spreads are, are going up. As in the data, we observe that this, the position of dealers is decreasing in the, as, as we get closer to a default event because the dealers are supplying more insurance to the smaller investors. 
uh, the model also replicates that as we get closer to a fault episode, uh, the VDASC express for bonds are increasing, but also for the CDS, the VDASC express are going up. Since these uh, intermediation fees are going up in both markets, the, there are larger deviations in over-the-counter markets from the CDS uh, bond basis uh, in, this, in this model. Uh, then uh, with the model, we, we go and do policy analysis. I, I will kind of skip it because this is very preliminary and I'm out of time. Um, so I'll, I'll just tell you the, the, the results. So in this paper, we argue that the CDS market is relevant and interacts with the bond market, uh, mainly because there are trading frictions and regulatory frictions in the economy. And we develop a model where bonds and CDS market uh, uh, are present. Uh, we calibrate the model to replicate some saving features in, in the data, in particular that dealers provide more insurance when the probability of a default is larger and their insurance provided on providers on average. And then we are, we are aiming to use this model to, to explain what are the effects of different types of regulations as uh, restricting the amount of transactions in CES and uh, bond market, but uh, they, they are very preliminary so far. So yeah, thank you very much. And sorry good. For standing. Very good. So let's discuss it. Pierre Olivier from UCLA. Thanks. Uh, so first, I would like uh, to thank uh, the organizer uh, for inviting me to uh, discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Um, let me uh, start by saying that uh, I found this paper uh, super nice. Uh, of course, a, a big fan of that type of research. And I found that the author are, are developing a, a great framework to study the interplay between OTC market and sovereign defaults. Uh, the model helps providing uh, transparent theoretical and quantitative analysis. And, you know, as uh, Gaston said, it's a bit preliminary still, but there's lots of very interesting questions and answers that are already uh, in the draft. So what I'll do in the discussion is I'm uh, going to lay out a simplified model uh, to think about the entry effect at play at the model. So, you know, one thing that goes on in the model is that uh, dealer's entry responds to uh, uh, to change in sovereign risk condition and those uh, entry response by dealers are key to a number of uh, of finding uh, in the paper and are key for instance to replicate this observation that uh, when sovereign risk increase uh, dealers sell more insurance uh, to uh, to investors so my simplified model will aim at try to understand why those entry effects are so important. And then I'll offer uh, a few comments. So here is a simplified model. So I'm going to imagine uh, a two period economy uh, populated by two types of uh, agents with constant absolute risk aversion. So constant absolute risk aversion is going to be a special case of those quasi-linear preferences that Gaston and Scott are, are using uh, or preference with no wealth effect. Uh, the two types of agents are like in Gaston model, investors and dealers. Uh, we'll have one asset in positive supply, I'm going to denote the supply by B. Uh, that asset is interpreted as sovereign bond, the payoff uh, of the sovereign bond um, will be denoted by um, one minus L. So one is, oops, this is supposed to be nicer. All right, let me do that. Uh, one is the face value and L is uh, the default loss so on, on uh, when the sovereign, uh, uh, so the probably when the sovereign defaults. So this L variable represents sovereign risk uh, in my mind. Uh, in addition to this positive supply of asset, uh, I'm going to assume just uh, like Gaston is going to do that investors have some background exposure to sovereign risk. So they own say some a portfolio of uh, of assets, maybe uh, they are the, the corporate, you know, loans made to uh, private firms in the country, etc. Uh, that also expose them to sovereign risk. So, you know, the simple way to do so is to imagine that investors uh, hold uh, on a per capita basis uh, a number omega of non-tradable assets, so say loans made to a corporation in the country, with a payoff that's perfectly correlated to the payoff of the sovereign. Uh, bond. So the importance of this background risk is going to be, as will be clear soon, to generate 
that uh, uh, dealers are net sellers uh, of uh, protection in, uh, in equilibrium. All right, so I assume there are two markets, a spot market for the bonds, the payoff of the uh, securities that is trading is one minus L, and a CDS market to buy insurance against default risk. So now the payoff is L, right? So when the uh, when sovereign defaults, your insurance contract pay you exactly uh, the amount necessary to uh, make your bond risk-free. Uh, and then I assume, and that's a luxury I can have as a discussant, a very a sim much simpler market structure. Uh, I assume a competitive market with limited investors' participation. So I assume that a certain measure of investors participate only in the bond market, another measure of investors, different one, participate in the CDS market, and then that there's uh, dealers who participate in, in both markets, the CDS and the bond market. So that is a simple way to uh, capture some of what goes on in the model, right? Because what search does is that it, you know, it brings some investor in the bond market, you know, investor going to matching function, and they're able to match with dealers uh, with some probability, it brings some investor in the CDS market, and endogenously the more investors just do one of the two. Uh, and then dealers are in both markets. So of course, you know, the big difference uh, between what I'm presenting now and what's in the model is that I'm taking those measures as, as exogenous. So the, uh, what's going to be very important in the model of Gaston is that those N, those measures of investors in the bond market, the CDS market, and the overall measure of dealers are all endogenous and they're endogenized through this comparative search model with free entry of dealers. So my goal in the next few slides will be to understand why making those N endogenous is going to be key to a number of results of the paper. All right, so I'm going to be very quick on this slide. This is a slide that represents the, uh, the virus, uh, the problem of the virus agents in the model. So I denote by uh, big U of X here, that's a certainty equivalent uh, payoff uh, of, um, um, of receiving an insurance payment, uh, uh, sorry, the X insurance payment uh, on, on CDS contract. Uh, so that, um, you know, if, uh, if L, for instance, normally distributed, this U of X is just a quadratic function, it's the usual uh, certainty equivalent uh, CARA a quadratic function, otherwise it's just a, an increasing on concave function. Um, so the problem of a bond market investor, so that would be an investor who's only present in the bond market, will be to choose the amount of bond he or she holds, BI, in order to maximize uh, the objective that you see on the slide. That objective has a BI over here. So BI here is the number of bond time the face value. It has U of, you know, a negative position in protection, right? Because when you long bond, you face default risk and what's negative uh, position in protection is minus the amount of background risk and minus the amount of bond you hold. And then minus Q times BI is uh, the price you pay to uh, buy those bonds. And then we can write, you know, the objective of CDS market investors and dealers in, in similar ways. So long story short, if you solve for equilibrium, you end up uh, obtaining the, the following results, uh, which is fairly standard. Um, because we have dealers who participate in both markets, you know, they overcome the limited market participation friction, and we obtain full risk clearing in equilibrium. And in equilibrium, each agent, either dealer or investor, end up holding the exact same amount of sovereign risk, which is the amount of sovereign risk per capita in the economy. Uh, and that amount is shown in the green box on the slide. Uh, it's B, so the, that's the amount of sovereign risk that come from bond in positive supply at the numerator, plus you know the number of investors in the bond market and the CDS market times the background risk, so that's the total amount of background risk uh, in the economy, all divided at the uh, denominator by uh, the total number of agents in the economy, either investors or dealers. And the way agents hold end up holding that amount of sovereign risk will be via portfolio of Bone, CDS, and you know the, the, the original background risk that uh, that they had, uh, and then you know going back to the title of uh, Gaston's paper, uh, what you find is that uh, 
you know, in equilibrium, dealers provide liquidity. So basically, they end up bridging the two markets, the CDS and the bond market, in order to achieve uh, full resharing. So for instance, where there's no much background risk, what you find is that uh, dealers end up buying extra bond in the spot market relative to investor, and they hedge those bonds, uh, sovereign risk, in the CDS market. And by hedging, what they end up doing is transferring risk, sovereign risk, to uh, those investors who are only participating in the CDS market. So a key uh, object of interest for the author is the uh, overall CDS position of uh, the dealer sector. And that overall CDS position uh, can be calculated in an easy way. Uh, and it's shown uh, at the top of the slide. Uh, and that's overall CDS position depends you know, positively on the total number of bond, sovereign bond in the economy. Why? It's because you know, the more sovereign bond there is, the more uh, dealers absorb them and hedge them by uh, buying protection in the CDS market. But it depends also negatively on the total amount of background risk. Why? It's because dealers end up also absorbing some of the risk, so the background risk of those investors who only participate in the uh, CTS market. And so you see how background risk here is key for uh, you know, the dealer position in the green box to be negative for having dealers not buying protection only, but also selling protection. Um, so one key observation that you, uh, you can, you, in, the, in this model is that um, the, the position of dealers uh, is independent of the distribution of L, right? Of, the, of how much you know, default risk there is. So if L becomes uh, larger in expectation, say there is uh, the, the probability of default is larger, then you know, dealers don't respond by holding more, uh, by selling more insurance here. So that's a typical result in that type of, uh, in that type of environment that's come from the, uh, uh, the assumption of CARA preference over here, uh, which is that the manifestation of full resharing is that everyone holds the same amount. You know, uh, so you know, if it were apple or bananas, we'll find that you know, everyone in the economy holds the same amount of apple or banana, regardless of how good those apple and banana taste. So what that tells you is that to replicate this observation that the author make that dealers end up selling more insurance uh, when default risk increased, what you need is a model of entry, right? You need a model where those ends uh, respond, right, to, to entry. So you need, for instance, that and you, can, you can see from the formula that if you find that uh, if you can get a large increase in the number of dealers in the model, then you'll find that dealers indeed sell more insurance in response to an increase in default risk. The way it works in the model is that what happened when default risk increased, and that's a nice feature of those competitive search the model is that the gains from trading uh, go up and the, the increase in gain from trade lead to more uh, dealer entry. Uh, so that ends up uh, increasing the risk bearing capacity of the dealer sector. And you can see in the formula that, you know, if this N over here and D, the number of dealers uh, go up, but you know, the number of investors don't move too much, uh, that will lead to uh, a larger sale uh, of insurance uh, against the background sovereignty and also uh, less purchase of uh, hedging uh, of CDS protection uh, in the bond market and the two effects go in the same direction of uh, increasing the, of reducing, uh, you know, making it less positive or more negative, uh, the CDS position of dealers. And those entry effects are the heart of everything else, all the counterintuitive, nice counterintuitive results uh, in the model, for instance, you know, the, the impact of, um, uh, um, banning a short sale on a bond price. So what I'm going to do next is uh, provide a few comments uh, about uh, some other aspects uh, of the model. So I, you know, I know I'm doing mostly theory, but uh, I'm going to give it a try at uh, giving some uh, comment about the empirical evidence. Um, so the empirical evidence is interpreted as dealers sell more CDS when sovereign risk increases. And the way the empirical evidence is structured is by measuring sovereign risk uh, by yield spread. Uh, however, you know, as we all know, the yield spread uh, has different components. You know, some components have to do with sovereign risk and others with liquidity. Um, so 
what I'd like to, uh, to argue is that uh, the relationship that is observed could be in principle generated by change of li in liquidity alone. So maybe it's not so super plausible, but theoretically that's a possibility. So for instance, we could have in the little model I presented that the measure, the, the CDS market becomes relatively more liquid in the sense that uh, certainly more of investor and uh, are able to access that market. And if we keep the other measures the same, and if we keep the, uh, the, the supply of bond relatively small relative to the amount of background risk, what you see is that this would lead dealers to sell more CDS to investors because you know more background risk comes on the CDS market. And at the same time, dealers end up holding more sovereign risk. And because they have more sovereign risk, they become more reluctant to hold bonds, so yield spread grow. So, uh, you know, it's probably not what goes on in the data. I'm pretty sure that a lot of yield spread increase that we see, for instance, in Argentina are come from an increase in, in sovereign risk. But what that says is that it might be nice to uh, provide the empirical evidence with more direct measure of the increase in, in sovereign risk, maybe using uh, downgrades, uh, maybe, um, you, you know, using a more narrative approach with default events, etc., etc. Um, so, the, in, in the current version of the paper, uh, there's a number of results that are shown by way of numerical examples. Uh, and that's, you know, that's often the case because entry effects are often character, hard to characterize by hand. So, you know, I, I picked the version of the model that was easier to, to solve by hand, the one where there's no entry. Um, but here, I'd like to share with the author maybe uh, an identical trick that could be useful. Uh, sometime in this type of model, it's useful to derive Taylor expansion. So, just to uh, work out equilibrium near a limit where everything else is known in closed form. So, for instance, the zero sovereign risk case uh, is known in closed form, or the zero entry cost, uh, Gaston showed us, is known in closed form. And often, once you know, you know, one case uh, in closed form, you can calculate the derivative or the Jacobian of the system of equilibrium equation near that case uh, in closed form as well. And of and that comes sometimes. I mean lead to very nice formulas for all equilibrium objects that allow you to derive the comparative static you're interested in. Um, so some uh, some part of uh, the paper, um, and you know, uh, Gaston had that in his job market paper also a bit uh, earlier, uh, and I think that's a very nice part of the paper, is to uh, embed those model of other counter market in a general equilibrium structure. So the, the general equilibrium structure comes here from the fact that um, in addition to having an OTC market block, so we have the sovereign uh, debt block that uh, tell us about the utility of uh, the consumer in the sovereign country uh, in interest uh, of interest. So that's you know super nice. I think you know for all of us who do uh, market microstructure theory, welfare is always a bit tricky because you know who will ever live in our model are you know, who trade in the market. But uh, welfare presumably depend on uh, you know, the, the rest of the economy, the firms who invest, uh, the, uh, the, the consumer who hold bonds in their portfolio for retirement and whatnot. So one something very nice about uh, the present paper is that uh, they, you know, they, they can provide presumably a more credible analysis of welfare by looking you know, basically at the utility of those investors, of those agents who probably are we care most about uh, for welfare analysis. So here, the consumer in the sovereign country of uh, consideration. So um, I think something that would be nice to do in the model that's not done currently is to provide welfare measurements. So not only study the effect on bond price, etc., but also uh, study uh, the impact on the sovereign country uh, welfare. Um, all right. So. Um, that's all I have to say. So in conclusion, I'd like to uh, congratulate the author. It's a great agenda and framework. And uh, I look forward to reading uh, the next uh, version of the paper or the next paper. Thank you.